many of us have been in the trenches together, standing for life, and it's always a blessing to see you, and it's always very encouraging to see so many young people that are so gifted, bring energy and talent into the movement that is so needed right now. So this is a wonderful time as we come together, and I just wanted to let you know that the event is about to begin, and here's our guest of honor and Marjorie Dannenfelser. Thank you. Welcome to everyone, pro-life leaders, um, member of Congress, former member of Congress, Marilyn Musgrave, my husband, <laughs> and members of the media. Um, it is my great pleasure to introduce Congresswoman Elise Stefanik. Uh, we supported her um, early on, which is what Susan B. Anthony, Pro-Life America, loves to do for women who are models of what it means to be a pro-woman uh, and pro-life uh, elected official. Well, you can say a lot of things, and I've introduced a lot of people in this town over the years. We've had galas galore. I introduce people all the time. Uh, the resumes are fantastic, but um, I'm going to refer to you as Elise, if you don't mind, for just a minute. Um, you can set, you can cite the resumes, but it's very rare that you can say, I actually like <laughs> Congresswoman Elise Stefanik. And it's also very rare that, um, that as an overachiever, she's a very likable overachiever, <laughs> also a rare commodity in this town. And what do I mean by overachieving? Uh, in, in order of reverse importance, she's the highest ranking woman Republican in the House of Representatives. She was the youngest woman ever elected to Congress when she was sworn in in 2014. She was the first woman ever elected to her district, District 20, the great district of New York 21. But most of all, she is the youngest mom in Congress, the most important thing in that list. That's not bad for a Harvard grad overachiever. <laughs> um, and she comes from a long line of overachievers. And I refer to the women who have helped build America throughout American history to help make it great, and especially stepped up when there were great human rights wrongs going on in this country and led movements to directly uh, overturn, to directly reveal and, and uh, outlaw the great human rights uh, abuses of our time. I refer to the abolitionist, uh, for an example, abolitionist and suffragist Susan B. Anthony as, as a perfect example. Um, Susan B. Anthony, who you know quite well because I believe she lived right down the road from where you live uh, and you've been a part of helping uh, restore uh, her property and her name and her, and her uh, legacy. Um, and uh, Fannie Lou Hammer, um, from Mississippi, who not as many people know, but was a, um, a very powerful civil rights activist who suffered dramatically. She was the 20th of 20 children. She uh, worked in the cotton fields uh, starting at age 13. She uh, joined early on the civil rights movement in Mississippi, reformed within her party that human rights wrong, and a great pro-life uh, standard bearer who called abortion child murder along with Susan B. Anthony and all the other um, uh, beautiful human rights leaders of our time. You are in that chain and you are um, surrounded by a heavenly host of women like you. And I, I'm so proud that we get to hold you up as an example of what it means to fight. Fight um, with all the, your, your feminine intellectual gifts uh, for the rights of unborn children and their mothers. So thank you and we're looking forward to hearing what you have to say. Well, thank you, Marjorie, for that kind introduction, and thank you to Susan B. Anthony, Pro-Life America, for your tireless work protecting children and mothers. You have been such strong supporters since I first ran for Congress in 2014, and it's truly inspiring to look back on all of your hard work and recognize the historic achievements in moving the life movement forward. It's truly an honor to be here with you all today on the eve of the first anniversary of the Supreme Court's historic decision in Dobbs v. Jackson Women's Health Organization. As Marjorie mentioned in her introduction, I have the distinct honor of representing New York's 21st Congressional District, where I was proudly the youngest.
And as the youngest woman in history to serve in top leadership in Congress for either party, I'm proud to currently serve as chair of the House Republican Conference, where each week I lead House Republicans in communicating our conservative policy agenda to the American people. But by far, the most important and meaningful title I have in my life is mom. Almost two years ago, my husband Matt and I were blessed with our beautiful baby boy, Sam. And as every parent will tell you, our world changed forever for the better, and we simply cannot imagine life without our Sam. So it is as Sam's mom and the newest mom in Congress that I know there is nothing more extraordinary than the miracle of life. Hearing Sam's heartbeat, feeling his first flutters and kicks, and awaiting his healthy cry after delivery are etched in my heart forever. This year's anniversary of Dobbs is a moment to embrace how far we have come in this movement to protect the sanctity of life. It is also an historic opportunity to continue to strengthen the culture of life in America as we look to the future. For 50 years, there have been despicable and violent attacks on life, many of the worst happening in the last year alone. Yet we are steadfast in standing up and providing a voice for the voiceless and the most vulnerable, the unborn who cannot speak for themselves. Since Roe was overturned and the Supreme Court restored the correct interpretation of our Constitution, 25 states have life-saving laws on the books. Common sense policies like parental consent laws, limits on late-term abortion, and informed consent provisions that were previously tossed aside by radical activist judges are now protected and enshrined. These efforts have protected the lives of an estimated 181,000 children. Sadly, many Americans took the opposite approach last year, and some of the worst aspects of humanity were on display. There was an unprecedented leak at the Supreme Court meant to intimidate and obstruct the justices, jeopardizing the independence of our political system and severely damaging the reputation of the court. Extremists broke the law and picketed the homes of the justices, plotted to assassinate Justice Kavanaugh, and firebombed scores of pro-life pregnancy centers and vandalized churches that provide support to women, babies, and families. Then Speaker Nancy Pelosi and Majority Leader Chuck Schumer made these incidents worse by slow walking security protections for justices and refusing to denounce such heinous attacks. Pro-life advocates were beaten by radicals in the streets, illegally targeted by President Biden's FBI, and arrested in their homes with their children present, all for peacefully protesting and standing for life. We saw the loyal stenographers for the far left in the mainstream media promote division and discord, even defending and making excuses for the criminal actions of the extreme pro-abortion activists. This debate is certainly intense, heartfelt, and deeply personal on all sides. But I am so proud that the vast majority of Americans involved in this important conversation continue to conduct themselves in a respectful, meaningful manner that advances the dialogue. We've spoken to our neighbors, organized in churches and community groups, donated to charities, and supported state and federal legislation and candidates. For nearly 50 years under Roe v. Wade, it was this fundamental tenet of free speech and debate that was silenced and sidelined. We should embrace this debate. It provides a moment to rise to the new challenges the life movement faces. It also holds the promise of new and better policies that protect the unborn, encourage and support women, and expect more from fathers. It allows us to argue and win the fact that the right to life is the foundational issue of human rights. As our founders brilliantly proclaimed in the Declaration of Independence, each of us is endowed with the right to life by our Creator. Without this right, no other right has any meaning. And because of that, this debate today is a primary question of public policy for state, local, and yes, federal policymakers. It was Roe v. Wade sweeping away the protective laws of all 50 states, laws both liberal and conservative, each of them enacted by the people's elected representatives that deviated from a course that has been progressing legally and medically toward enhancement of the rights of the unborn. Even the late Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg reflected that 
quote, Roe v. Wade invited no dialogue with legislators. Instead, it seemed entirely to remove the ball from the legislators' court. If you listen to the far left, common sense state laws are new and extreme, the invention of religious extremists, opponents of women's rights, and antagonists of modern health care. We know the exact opposite is true. Pro-life advocates are not extremists, we are not anti-women, and terminating the life of an unborn child is not health care. In fact, our pro-life convictions are sewn into the very fabric of America. Just look to the great Henry Hyde, the towering advocate for life, whose federal funding amendments have saved, according to the best data available, the lives of more than 2.5 million of our fellow Americans. Speaking at the University of Notre Dame, and I know we have an intern from Notre Dame here today, Hyde said, quote, when the great wave of Catholic immigration to America occurred in the 19th century, Catholics didn't import pro-life attitudes. These were already here. This was the consensus, not only of the United States, but also of all civilized people. Abortion was wrong. The Supreme Court didn't express a new consensus in 1973. It attacked the consensus that already existed, end quote. That consensus was forged by scientific developments regarding the unborn and the action of the newly founded medical societies like the American Medical Association in 1847. Modern medicine provides further proof that unborn children are already amazingly complex human beings. At just six weeks, a baby's heart beats approximately 98 beats per minute. By week 10, a baby has arms, fingers, and toes, and can sigh and stretch. At 12 weeks, a baby's brain is creating 250,000 neurons a minute, developing pathways and connections that survive well into adulthood. At 15 weeks, we know an unborn child feels and responds to pain. And as little as 22 weeks, science tells us that a child can survive outside the womb. This is a medical miracle. And no one speaks more eloquently on this fact than parents of premature babies, blessed with a child coming into their lives a little earlier than expected. Sadly, we also see the pain and suffering when women who experience a tragic miscarriage courageously talk about the loss of life that they will mourn forever. Today, pro-abortion advocates ignore this consensus and want to go far further than just enshrining Roe, putting forward the most radical abortion on demand paid for by the taxpayers up until and after birth. Within the last month, governors in two states have actually vetoed bills that would have safeguarded the lives of children born alive after attempted abortions. On the contrary, in the 118th Congress, House Republicans proudly passed the Born Alive Abortion Survivors Protection Act, providing health care for babies who survive abortion procedures. Yet, 210 House Democrats alarmingly voted against this bill. The extreme Democrat position of today is to oppose protecting children who are born alive, refuse to provide access to any medical care, and leave babies to die after their first miraculous breaths outside the womb. Just last year, House Democrat leadership and President Joe Biden refused to condemn attacks against crisis pregnancy centers, churches, and pro-life organizations by radical, violent, far-left activists. These facilities were set ablaze, defaced, and vandalized. It's reported that as of June 2023, there have been at least 87 attacks on pregnancy resource centers and 165 attacks on Catholic churches since the May 2022 Dobbs leak. In the Democrat Party of today, the silence was deafening. Since President Biden and Democrats failed to condemn this violence, House Republicans passed a resolution in support of crisis pregnancy centers and rightfully condemned these attacks and vandalism. It is telling that 209 House Democrats voted against this resolution. The reality is, is that it's Republicans and the life movement who represent the consensus, and it is the Democrats who are the radicals, out of touch with the vast majority of the American people. The majority of the American people believe a baby born alive should be provided necessary health care. The majority of the American people condemn violent attacks on crisis pregnancy centers. 
And while those in the media want to portray Americans as viscerally divided on this issue, I believe there is far more consensus than the media would like to admit. A recent Harvard-Harris national poll found 72% of voters support limiting abortions at 15 weeks, including 75% of women, 70% of independents, and 60% of Democrats. The vast majority of Americans oppose late-term abortion. 60% of Americans oppose using taxpayer dollars to fund abortions. 91% of Americans support pregnancy centers and the vital material, medical, and educational support to mothers they offer both during their pregnancy and after their baby is born. 58% of Americans say that healthcare professionals should not be required to perform abortions if they have moral objections. It was not so long ago that even the Democrat Party platform stated abortion should be safe, legal, and rare. And now rare? is never uttered. It is Democrats in Congress and in state governments, along with the Biden administration, who are wildly out of step with the values of the American people. Less than 10% of voters support the position of today's radical Democrat party that there should be no limits on abortion. Given this very clear consensus, we have a historic opportunity to turn our attention to enacting a federal law that protects an unborn child when he or she can feel pain. This is why I have been a proud sponsor of the Pain Capable Bill since I was first sworn into office. While I strongly support ensuring robust pro-life riders of course remain intact and we protect the whole Hyde family of amendments in our appropriations process that we're beginning right now, we should also turn our attention to a permanent solution and ensure taxpayer dollars never support abortions. At the same time, standing for life goes beyond a child's birth. The life movement deeply understands that we must support and lift up mothers and families. And it is why the life movement must continue to advocate for the value and dignity of all Americans throughout their lives. And we can do that by focusing on the evident needs of new mothers and fathers. I have been a strong supporter of the Care for Her Act, legislation establishing a commitment to care for expecting mothers and their unborn children through expanding the child tax credit, providing state and federal resources, distributing grants for housing, job training, and more. I was also proud to vote for the Pump for Nursing Mothers Act to provide working mothers the access and accommodations they need while breastfeeding while they continue to work. And I was proud to lead the effort to hold Joe Biden and his FDA accountable to ensure that new parents had access to baby formula amidst a nationwide shortage. Many working parents within my district have told me that they struggle to find childcare options that make sense for their family. That's why I strongly support the After Hours Child Care Act, which expands the traditional guidelines of federally funded daycare to evening care and I was proud to introduce the Family Child Care Network Act to make it easier for family child care providers and home-based care to operate, especially in rural communities like my district where there are limited child care options. And as a young mother in Congress, I am very conscientious of the importance of role models. My husband, Matt, and I have been just humbled by the overwhelming number of families and especially new or soon-to-be parents who have reached out to us as examples of hardworking professionals and dedicated parents. I was fortunate enough myself to have Kathy McMorris Rogers as a mentor and role model to me in Congress. Kathy gave birth three times while serving in the House, and I'm not sure I would have had the confidence to serve in top leadership as a young mother were it not for Kathy's extraordinary example. House Republicans are excited that later this year, our congressional family is growing and already has grown as we welcome three new babies with Dan Crenshaw of Texas, Max Miller of Ohio, and Anna Paulina Luna of Florida, all welcoming their first child. Everything we work toward and fight for every day is for the next generation to have life and opportunity. I truly believe that the Supreme Court entrusted all of us with the responsibility of taking an important and deeply personal issue and building consensus to provide every child mother, family, and especially the unborn children, this truly precious and sacred opportunity at life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. While the media and the far left want to make this about sowing division and scoring political points, 
I believe that the pro-life movement can and will continue to work to save more lives and support women and families. Protecting life and defending the unborn are not extreme positions. They are fundamental to human rights and the American dream. And I know the life movement will always remember our moral compass and be worthy of this fight, be worthy of this mission. Thank you so much for the opportunity to speak with you today. God bless you, God bless the miracle of life, and God bless the United States of America. Thank you. beautiful speech, Congresswoman. Uh, I just want to tell you, I got a text from my granddaughter, Reagan, when I first got into the room and uh, saying, good morning, Grandma. She's on Colorado time. I love you. And I want to tell you, Congresswoman, how important it is to have a role model for you, for my seven granddaughters, for young people around this country. Uh, I am so encouraged by the example that you have set. Now, to a question men never get asked this and, and i'll ask the men too when i have opportunity but you have precious little sam and people always want to know how a woman with a career balances all this and respectfully i ask you could you you tell women and young women that aspire to marry and have children how you do it well thank you for the question and uh, i have really been humbled as i mentioned in my speech about the outpouring of support uh, from my colleagues, both men and women. Uh, and I will tell you that the House Republican Conference, before I came, became conference chair, truly embraced uh, our growing family. Uh, in terms of how we manage it, you know, every family is a little bit different, but we uh, are juggling two careers and we travel as a family of three. My husband, myself, and my son, Sam, travel back and forth to the district. So Sam is here with me this week. Uh, in Washington and when we're home in the district, uh, we're home as a family of three. Uh, we have a great support system with uh, family in upstate New York as well as sometimes in Washington. Uh, my mother-in-law will help us out uh, as well as we have a, we call it school, but a great little daycare uh, program for Sam uh, when he's here. So uh, we have made it work uh, and I, I have to tell you my colleagues have been so encouraging uh, and I, the importance of role models is not lost on me and having seen Kathy McMorris Rogers serve as conference chair uh, giving birth to three children uh, that really mattered to me and I realize it now more as a mom and interestingly some of the newly elected women in Congress many of whom I worked with to get elected we have the highest number of Republican women ever uh, have said to me that you know as they're having um, you know, they're thinking about what this next chapter could be for them becoming parents. They've said, you know, our, my husband and I talk about how do Elise and Matt do it, and they'll ask us questions, so I'm proud to serve as a role model for them. And I've had great conversations with Anna Paulina Luna, uh, who will give birth later, later this year, as well as uh, Dan Crenshaw and Max Miller, who uh, they also have questions too about how to juggle it. So thank you so much, and uh, I want to encourage all of uh, the young people here today, uh, both future moms and future dads, you can make it work and nothing is more precious uh, you will find than becoming a parent. It actually makes you better at doing your jobs and uh, it has given me a tremendous amount of energy of what I'm fighting for every day and that's the next generation and the world that I want to leave for Sam uh, and young children. Yes, Mrs. Ferguson. Um, hi there, you mentioned the family of, of Hyde Amendment. Could you elaborate on Congress's plan to protect that, the family of Hyde Amendments? Absolutely. Tax money abortion? So we have one of the most important responsibilities in the appropriations process. And if you remember in the last Congress under Speaker Pelosi and the Democrat majority, they are so radical that they wanted to eliminate all the Hyde protections in the appropriations process. We as House Republicans strongly stood up as well as Republicans in the Senate to protect those Hyde provisions. We intend to do that in the appropriations process. And because we're in the majority, you know, we will we'll get that done. It's very important. But it is a lesson for all of us. What seemingly was a bipartisan consensus for decades, that is not the Democrat Party of today where it became basically the embrace position of House Democrats to eliminate those Hyde Amendments. Uh, 
um, or the family of Hyde amendments in the appropriations bill. So that's going to be an important, uh, an important issue for us in the appropriations process as well as many, many other uh, parts that will be uh, important in this appropriations fight. And we are going to have to show strength, and we will as House Republicans. In addition to the Hyde Amendments, you also have H.R. 7, No Taxpayer Funding for Abortions. Uh, that is also important as a permanent solution as well as the appropriations uh, protections. Other questions, maybe from our interns. Any interns have questions? Yes, ma'am. Star Parker, BlackUnionNews.com. And now that Dobbs is a reality and all the numbers are coming in, uh, we know that 20 million African American babies uh, were washed away due to Roe. Uh, that um, Planned Parenthood deliberately has targeted our poorest communities. So my question is, I mean, that that is more babies gone and adults, potential adults, than were alive during the civil rights movement. So my question is, are you finding anyone on the other side of the aisle in the Congressional Black Caucus and or other liberals who are representing areas to where this has been such a tragedy uh, that are willing to work with you to protect life in any way whatsoever? Well, the Democrat Party of today has really run those voices out of their caucus. Uh, if you look at some of the primary challenges uh, that have happened, even since I've been in Congress, of how radical today's Democrat Party is. But I will tell you what is so important to me is look to the voters, look to the American people. It's not just registered Republicans, and I went through some of this polling. It's independents as well as registered Democrats who support our consensus position, which is protecting life. They do not support the radical positions of the Joe Biden, Joe Biden and his administration and today's Democrat Party in the House. So I believe that that is a huge opportunity for us to continue to build this consensus as we work towards strong pro-life legislation. So I always look to the people. The people are the most important voices and it's gonna be very important that they make their voices heard in the elections at all levels, at state level, in state houses, in governor's races, as well as uh, the upcoming federal races in 2024. Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. Um, Hazel London, I'm with Gary Bauer at American Values. Uh, my question really, to piggyback off of, off of STAR, uh, a lot of the minority communities find that Life, we support life, but life after birth can be difficult. How do you know to find support, having daycare and aftercare for the communities that you know parents might be having to work multiple jobs and stuff like that? So, a lot of times, you know, we say that okay, we're going to support, but how do we plan to put some hands on and some actual physical things that we can see to bring those communities in with us and to target them better? It's a great question, and uh, one of the bills that I've introduced strengthens home-based child care as well as family-centered child care. That's certainly an issue in my district. We work with our local chambers of commerce, and they will tell you child care uh, is one of their top concerns when it comes to making sure that they uh, can continue to have their workforce in place. So there are Republicans leading on this issue. That would pass through the Education and Workforce Committee, because it really is a workforce committee. But I also talked about it's something that the life community, we can and should be embracing. Uh, to provide uh, that support, particularly for our young mothers and young fathers, uh, and particularly for our single mothers who uh, are working as well as raising their children. This is about embracing the continuum of life uh, and uh, look to the legislation that I've introduced and hopefully we're, we'll be able to uh, continue to come up with other solutions as well as the expanded child tax credit, the Care for Her Act, which we've worked with so many of the pro-life organizations uh, on. Great, well, thank you, everyone. Is it, yes, sir? I have a question. Sure. Uh, Ryan Foley with the Christian Coast. So you mentioned a bunch of legislation, the Care for Her Act, the Pump for Nursing Mothers Act, the After Hours Child Care Act, and the Family Child Care Network Act. I was wondering, what is the status of each of these pieces of legislation? 
Sure. So each of those pieces of legislation have been introduced. They have not gone through, well, Pump for Nursing Mothers Act actually passed and was signed into law. Uh, the other bills have been introduced. They would have to work through the committee process. Uh, the next major focus for us is this appropriations process that I talked about. Uh, the subcommittees are already working through those appropriations bills, uh, and that would ensure those Hyde protections. So even though you didn't ask about Hyde, that's one of the important legislative kind of pending issues that you'll see faster movement on in terms of protecting the Hyde Amendment in our appropriations bills. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. I was wondering, I just see a stand on the OST news. Um, so a year out from DOS, in this new political legal landscape, I was wondering if you could speak a little bit to the difference between um, state legislators and Congress. Where does that, um, what is the role of Congress for, versus the role of a state legislator? Sure, so I believe that at the federal level, we do have a role to play in this, uh, ensuring that no taxpayer dollars go towards funding abortions, and also um, having a minimum. Uh, the 15 weeks bill with exceptions for rape and sex and life of the mother, uh, that's legislation that I support. And then states are able to uh, continue to sign into law strong pro-life legislation. But what's important is that both the federal and state level, those are elected officials making the decision, who are elected by the American people rather than radical judges um, who frankly took the voice away from the American people uh, when they took that away from legislators. We rightly have that back, and it's our responsibility. Chairman Socratic, thank you so much. We're so grateful for you.